this is the third workshop today. It's about technical training and skill levels. My name is still Thomas Gossmann, but most people know me on the name Gossi. I see some new faces. And this is what we are doing today. We have the first part is technical training. The second part is skill levels. And the third part is about the new levels and the still level committee, development committee I led in the last two years. So, hurry, you're late. Okay, so for the first part, um, no, before I start, I need to do that because Felix is upset anyway. If I speak too fast, please raise your hand and slow me down. If you can't hear me, please raise your hand that I speak louder but I don't have hardly any voice left. Uh, if you do not understand anything or I'm too fast, I'm too quick, please raise your hand to slow me down and explain things differently so everybody can follow. Uh, so, who is a native German speaker? Oh, there are plenty. Okay, so there are some English translations and I don't know if they are right because it was really hard to look them up in the dictionary. I first thought it was hard, but then I found out it was really, really hard. So I did my best and see how I can uh, get this. So, technical training. Moritz, you're late. Hurry. We wait for him. Okay. So now, if Felix comes in, you slap him, right? Okay, uh, so technical training. What's that? Technical training is how do you teach tricks? And the first question is, how do you do that? How do you teach tricks to your kids that you train? What is your normal procedure? Like if so, well, yeah, what is your normal procedure? Just ask that first. What do you do? Was machst du im Training? Oh, Till till has written. You show the trick first. And then I explain what's important. Okay. You show the trick and then he explains what's important. Have we any other procedures? Oh, Till again and then Thorsten. I give hands so that it's. You give hats? Hands. Hands, okay, hands. Hands sound better, yeah. I give my head sometimes because they can grab my head better because my shoulder is too low. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Thorsten. Okay, so and translate what you said. He tries to motivate the people so they can do it on their own. That's great. Uh, any others? What about you guys over here? Oh. I yell at him. You yell at him? Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. I do that too if they at the end, at, at the other end of the gym. So I yell over there, through the gym. Say yeah, I got it! And that's my yelling. Yeah. So Moritz, what did you do? Um, I asked other kids who already can do the trick to explain it to the other kids because yeah. they know where the problems are. And you, as a good rider, rides for ten years. And for example, I learned one. You're yeah, not follow us. <laughs> yeah, good idea. So you move your stuff to others. <laughs> okay, okay, interesting. So, okay, now let's get a little bit more. Yeah, till, till, right. Okay, yeah, good idea. Yeah. So that was my so that next question. So think about a particular trick. Like, let's let's take wheel walk, okay? Mm -hmm. Wheel walk is the first basic trick, and most of us teach that trick to others. And so we already give instruction to one of the kids to do the wheel walk, and then we see something is wrong. What what's next? So till already announces or has the idea to ask the kid what was the problem. 
Do we have anything else? Do you do anything else? Okay, nobody has a motivation to raise his arm. Oh, there. I, uh, first, uh, when they are beginners, yeah. first I let them go backwards on, on a lane and then take the next step on a new cycle. Step. Okay, okay, cool. So step there's step by step. Yeah, step by step. Okay, that's good. Uh, so that was a good, good uh, conversation here. Thanks. Um, so what you do is the rider is execution, executing a trick and you have something in your mind, which I call now the reference, and you compare the reference with what you see, right? Mm. And then you see a difference, and then you teach the kid the difference, or you move on based on that difference here. So, and the reference is called technical template. Well, that, that's the translation I did on my own, but I don't know if that's correct. In German, it's Technik Leitbild. Uh, but I don't know the better word, but we stay with technical template for this talk, right? But keep it in brackets because I don't know if that's the right English uh, word. Um, okay, so what about technical templates? Uh, a technical template is um, an ideal of a trick execution. So we have them in most every other sport. So for example, swimming, and gymnastics, and so forth. <coughs> and they all have these technical templates. Um, but they do have a problem because that's an ideal for many people mm. and that does not affect your personal style. So for example if you are in swimming and we have the dolphin technique like this where you swimming like this and then go over water and if you see for example Michael Phelps, you know him? Michael Phelps is uh, the world champion in swimming like that. And if you get this or read this technical template you get in your education books and compare it to his style, it's completely different. Or that there are many, many points where it is different because he developed it based from the technical template to his own style. Mm. And he, is, he, he proves that he is fast with that because he wins so many times. So keep that in mind with the technical template. So, the technical template contain a learning description. Well, most of you have seen in the talk before, with the description, you see there was the gymnastic description for Rondat and then the, Germ uh, the, the English one for uh, whatever unicycle trick it was, it was to show. And you see there, we are lacking some description here, it's better for learning. And this technical template is based on the relationships I showed you before, yeah? So like this, we have the wheel walk, we have the one foot wheel walk. So this is the ancestor for the one foot wheel walk. And then we have the descent, sliding, cross, push, cross, over, stand walk, and one foot wheel walk backwards. So, yeah, that's what I said. So the reason for this is because they have the same movement actions. The movement action, for your memory again, are the tiny bits of which a movement consists of. So we have, for example, for the one foot wheel, we have the wheel, uh, one foot is pushing the wheel, so accelerate it, break it, get back, or accelerate, get back, accelerate, get back. And then we have the other foot sitting on the frame, and we see, okay, in gliding we have the same movement action by one because one foot is still on the frame. In Koshkos we have the same movement action like uh, um, uh, accelerating the wheel with your feet. In crossover, this is where it comes handy with what Felix said. In crossover, you use one foot wheel walk as a transition into crossover. That's why it's listed here. Sandwalk is like exactly the same as one foot wheel walk but just stand up. And one foot we walk backward, of course, it's just the opposite direction of the food. So this is how they connect to each other. The problem with the technical templates, they hardly exist. So they may appear in everyone's head. We do all have different technical templates, or probably none. And where would you go to find them? 
look in the book? In the library? No, you can't find them. I know they're not that books available. You probably find some on the internet or uh, ask people on the internet on forums or some uh, stuff like that and ask how they do it and you get an explanation or description there. But there's basically no, not that much literature available. The dictionary contains some description here, so, but not that many. They're as short as the standard skill list descriptions. So, movement is takes us the next item. Uh, which, so, if you have your technical template and then you make a difference between the execution and your technical template or the, your reference, right? And then you have a difference and see, okay, this is a movement mistake here. I'm meaning to fix that, and these are the movement mistakes you have. <clears throat> and if you don't identify them, this can have a potential problem to the rider. Because if you don't find them, they will speed up and stay in the rider. And probably someday a trick will come which relies on that, that you haven't fixed before. You have a problem. So, if you have a wrong technical template, that can be because they're non-existent or probably wrong. So, here's an example for that. We have stand wall. And then we have stand gliding, and then these five descents of stand gliding. So if we do stand walk wrong, it stays into stand gliding, and may affect these, and furthermore, the tricks that depend on them. So the problem is, if we are using the hand for stand walk here, we avoid the foot control. So I go over here. So the foot control is basically, can you see all that? If you have your foot on the frame, you can move your legs like to the front, back, front, back. That's the foot control we have. And we have it for all stand up tricks. If you use your hand, you avoid learning this one. And this will kick you down later. So, Felix, you lost me So the problem are these tricks, the first one. So in catch food, catch food is like this one. Yes. And and if you get pulled by somebody else, you don't have one hand free to grab your seat. And then you need to have your foot control to handle that. And if you avoided learning this one, you have a problem. Mm. So the same counts for knee hold and by character balance, because they all have the same pattern here. Inverse, this are the examples where you hold one. But the real one is you have both hands over your head, not free for your seat. And we do have a problem. So if you avoid that, you probably do something wrong, even if you have the best intentions, right? So yeah, there's this one. So on my advice, never use the hand for stand-up tricks. Never ever, really, never ever. And it looks so bad, yeah? It looks like, oh God, I need to pay. Oh, done. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, so, because why? And this is because how your brain is learning. So these are two brains, uh, three brains are uh, in three different stadiums, but I would like to explain it to you. So these two, see these blue dots are neurons. And these connections here is where the information is sent between the neurons. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, listen me or not. Um, and the way your brain learns is that you have at the beginning very much of these connections. You see very much white stripes, right? And then if you learn, some are get more dominant, like this one here. And your brain realizes them and see, okay, this is how I learn, this is how the information is stored by creating these connections. And if you learn more and more, the others will drop.
because the brain don't need them anymore. And this is what you see on the third picture here. This is what we call an automated movement. So if you see all the Japanese doing their stand glides, they don't even think about it. They have a program ready in their brain. They click the play button and it runs. And this is how it gets into that program. And if you do have a mistake here, it stays over there and it's hard to get it out there. Is that clear how the brain works? Okay. So relearning. If you did something wrong, if you use your hand for stand walk or for stand up tricks, you probably need to relearn. So if you learn a new movement, it takes this time to master a trick. Okay? Just the green bar is just an indication to show, okay, this is the time it needs to learn the trick. And if you need to relearn it, it goes three steps. So the first one is you learn it in a less time because maybe it takes less time to use your hand for stand walk. Then you need to crash that movement, the what happens in your brain, and then you need to relearn it based on this new movement pattern. So it approximately takes double the time it would need to learn instead if you learn it in a fresh and blank way. So relearning is you need first destroy the old movement. So you have these connections in your brain and you need to cut them. That's really hard because you have so, spent so many hard work to get them and now you need to cut them through. Um, and then you need to practice the new movement. And this red little bar, this is when your brain is in a state which is called the chaos state. You have your, your movement saved in your brain, and then you cut it down, you destroy it. And then your brain gets into the, this chaos state. And then it is able to relearn new things. Because then the old thing is broken enough that it can save new things. And it's, if you don't break it, break it enough, you probably relearn the things you've learned before and it gets even worse. <laughs> okay. I have a little finger experiment for you to show you the chaos state. That's very, very simple. You just need your two fingers here. Can you help them in parallel? I show you, uh, I explain to you how it works and it's because it's pretty, pretty simple. You have them here in parallel and then you move them parallel. And now, go really, really fast. Really, really fast. Really. Really, try to, what's happening? They're not parallel anymore. They're not parallel anymore, right? Yeah. Uh. They are crossed afterwards. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? You have the parallel movement at the beginning, then you have something in between, which, ooh, what happens? And then you have the cross movement at the end. Okay? So the parallel movement is this one, then you have this chaos state in between, which is the red one where you don't know what the fingers are doing. And then you have the green one where they are crossed and working on a constant movement again. So you can try that again. It will happen every time, I promise. So go here with your fingers, really, really fast parallel, and then see what happens. Go really, really fast. Maybe you shouldn't touch here, but have your fingers moving parallel. But what are they going back to? What have I learned from the crossing? Why, are they, why do I want to cross? That's what your, what your body is automatically doing. Okay. So you find, oh, I can't do this anymore, I need to find something new. And that's what they do. But this is just an, an explanation for the chaos state. I think everybody who has done the parallel thing and realized, oh, what's that? And then you're crossway, and the crossway is stable. And in between you think, oh, what, what, what? Oh, yeah? And this is the chaos thing. Same happens if you jog constantly and you go faster, you're still walking and sometimes you turn over into a jogging. So on the, from, from walking here and then you realize, okay, this is better for me because it's uh, more, more uh, efficient. And this in between is also called the chaos state. Yeah, we have them in more ways. So now you have a word to describe that one. <laughs> can pose at home. So, <laughs> okay, that's about relearning. Is that clear? Okay, cool. Uh, and their voice is, of course, avoid relearning wherever it is possible. So,
Oh, watch this happening. I don't know. I think I already explained it. We'll see what's coming. Oh yeah, I have two probable causes for that. Why the relearning is happening, or why we, people need to relearn. And the first one is that we trap. The riders are got trapped. Uh, what do we mean by that? Is if you do stand walk with your hand, go up, and you're there, and can you do your stand walk? And it works really fast. And you get fast results. You think, oh cool, I'm done. But in reality, those that know, think no. <laughs> or already know, no, you're not done. So, but it gives fast results. And that's something we are heading for. And the problem is that these descendant movement actions, like if you are doing learning stand walk, you're not thinking about the tricks afterwards, right? And if you blend them, uh, blend them out in your brain, it makes sense to use your hand. And it goes faster because the foot control is that tiny movement. And with your hand, you have the whole upper body helping you finding balance. Uh, there's much more way, much more uh, muscles that are active to keep balance instead of just tiny movement here. Um, so this is why this is faster and the descent movement are blend out so we don't see uh, that we are doing something wrong here. So we are trapping into something but we don't know that, right? Um, and the other thing is when we stay at the Sternburg example, this, this essential movement is right the foot control, but we circumvent this essential movement. That's essential, but we circumvent it. And this was what's kicking us back out later. And it requires a really high discipline to counter. Even if you are standing next to them as a trainer, as a coach, and telling the people on the riders how to do it, they go by hand anyway. So it really takes high discipline for the rider, for the trainer, to see that, to identify it, and to keep pushing them not to do it. It's really, really tough. Especially if more people, like 16 to 20, and you cannot see all of them. That's impossible almost. So uh, here's the learning curve for that. So you see, this is the time, this is the skill, and you have this fast learning curve, but you're coming to an amplitude here. And this is something where you go close instead of continue moving. We have more of these learning curves later, and then I'll show you the difference, which is better. Okay, and the second problem are the trainers. Oh, the problem cause, I'm sorry. Um, because why? This is no offense to anybody. I'm a trainer, I'm a coach since like, 2005. And I encourage everybody to do that too. But even with their best will and their best intentions, if they do some, get something wrong, and they spread the something wrong, and they don't know if that is wrong, the wrong is still spread. And this is where the, where the errors go, and we need to better cut them. So, this is where you have more re knowledge which is required for that. And I think they aren't given that enough education. I mean, I started the first two education courses today. They will be available in the internet. They will be coming more. Um, so, this is what we need to do. This is a call to unicycling organizations to fit that gap. There's such a huge gap of where we don't know what we are and it's time to fill that. And we started that by the IF and we hope we can get, have good co uh, cooperation with all the national federations and stuff like that. So, these are the learning curves again. I already explained the orange one and the blue one is it takes you longer in the first to rise to really get the stand-up work done without the hand touching the seat or holding the seat. But then, when it comes to the later tricks, you almost can do the foot control, and you need, don't need to relearn that. And this is where the people that are... It takes longer for them in the beginning, but then they have a good basis, a good foundation they can build on, and then they go really, really high. Instead, for those 
the trapping into that state. Um, I mean, that's not just for Stanford. There's so many tricks. Um, but if it, that happens to all of them, that's probably something where they drop out with an age of 14 or something like that. Because they have too many movement errors already and it would take them so many time to get rid of them and to get a new base for them to learn that. And this is a really tough problem we're facing here. So my conclusion for just technical training is uh, that technical training can be constructive but also destructive. But no offense to anybody, it's just the way it is. Um, then if you do have some of these wrong technical templates, we probably can limit the rider because we explained them something wrong. And this is the problem we have here because we don't have them. Uh, so my appeal is for unicycling organizations to take actions here, that we have better education and that we share stuff. What have you done and how? That's really important. I mean, you can search in the blogs or forums and you hardly find anything about that. Um, I have asked the Japanese, especially Mayumi and Haruko, uh, I sent them an email and asked, what are these stand glides? You have these funny names, what are these? Or vice versa, what is this trick called like? And she sent me everything back, pictures, explanation, I was very thankful. And the daughter of Mayumi, Mayumi Sakino, uh, the daughter Yuka Sakino, you know, she's studying sports science as well, she's finished. And she had a blog in Japanese. And she was explaining the Bioman, the Bioman trick in like two or three posts, but they were Japanese. I used Google Chrome, he asked me, should I translate it to German? He said, yes, okay, do that. And was able to read the Japanese. I mean, it was understandable. She had very good pictures for that, with, with marks. So it was very understandable, was very thankful for that. And because it was Bielmann, the trick was called Bielmann. And Google Chrome translated it with Biermann. And it ended up as a very funny read. So don't be afraid of sharing this even in your native language. I mean, tools like, uh, like Google Chrome can translate it and make it uh, available to others. I mean, my Japanese is really, really bad. And I can speak like five words. So this isn't a problem, but share, really, do. Um, so then we come to my second part, which is skill levels. Um, I want to go into how skills can support your technical training. Uh, which goals the skill levels have and then we have I have a validation of the skill levels from 1998 um, and we go through the goals they have the progress the testing method uh, the wide vari variety of tricks they should teach and then we have some obsolete tricks and the skill level should give ideas and then we have at the end good parts of the skill levels that will show you who they are okay skill levels uh, not everyone is educated or will get educated as a trainer and skill levels come in as a handy tool to counter that. So you have just the skill levels and say, okay, I'm a father, look, look boy, I oh, have the skill levels. Okay, what we do next? And then you can look with your son. Um, and this is where the skill levels are exactly for. So for those people who don't have an education, they can look into the skill levels and they can go. And if the descriptions are right, really, I remember the descriptions. If they are right, because the skill levels can't print videos, you can't print videos, then uh, they help you very good at explaining tricks to the kids. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So the slides are faster than me. <laughs> Um, okay, how the, the skill levels should support the technical training? As I said, if they contain detailed description for the tricks, uh, that's both handy for the riders and the testers to see what are the important parts. Where she not need I look if I test somebody? So not don't let them pass if they use the hand for stand walk. Mm. That's a no go. And if this is in the description, then it's better for both. And 
I mean, I had this in the talk before, we have like thousands of tricks in unicycling and the skill levels can lead you through the jungle of the tricks because if you're new to you, you're selling that okay, here's this one wheel <laughs> what did I do? what can I do? and um, this is where the skill levels come in and uh, help you guide through here Yo. okay, the goals, this is from the IF rulebook and they say, this is the first paragraph of the IF skill levels from 1998. The first paragraph, and they say, they intended to encourage unicyclists to progress at an even pace over a wide variety of unicycling skills. These levels are not connected to the competition rules other than a description of how the skills are to be performed. Skill levels are useful for helping riders determine a sequence of skills to learn and to give them ideas for things to try. So, I bolded out the important parts. They should help to progress. They should teach a wide variety of uh, unicycling skills. They help determine the right sequence through that trick jungle, trick, little trick jungle. And they should give ideas about what a rider can do if he is new to unicycling. So what I've done is a validation of the 1998 skill levels in regarding to their own goals. So. The validation in general is does a thing do what it's supposed to do? Do the skill levels serve their own purpose? And for each goal, the bullet out one from the last slide, the, I did the validation by first setting up a test criteria and then check if the criteria is met. So the first one was the progress. Do they really progress? And uh, each level should be the base for the next level. Makes sense, right? So you should learn everything, and then if you can do that, it helps you to go to the next level. And the test criteria are the ancestors, as we had them before in the talk, are present for each fix in the level before. And then we have this importance. Tricks with low to zero importance should be in the higher levels, because they are less likely to uh, to be learned in the first levels, because at first, please learn the tricks that are that help you learn most other tricks. So, for example, crossover has less or uh, very low importance because you cannot do much of the uh, crossover. But for example, gliding, stand walk, or we walk have do have a really high importance, and you should learn them before that. Um, Okay, so this is a very funny and weird picture. Let me explain it. These are the skill levels from 1998. I cut out the mounts and the dismounts, right? Uh, this is skill level one here. Uh, so these are the levels in the uh, rows. And then the contents for each skill level are in the column down here. And the row down here. So this is skill level three, this is skill level four, this is skill level five. Yeah, and so forth. Okay, and then we have these wonderful colors. And, well, this picture, you will see this a little more often. Because for each validation, I have a new color. But I just have one picture. <laughs> um, so for the first one, the test card here was to see if the ancestors are in the level before. And those tricks or skills that don't have ancestors of this red X. You can see that? It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. So there are some more tricks. And this is I just based on the on the relationships a trick has, this is something I was able to mark out. And you see these these grey lines are the relationships between these tricks and those with the with the, with the red X they miss these relationships. So these are the tricks where the progress is not optimal because they lack some ancestors before. And it was easy to count them. So we have a total skills of 85 and we have 12 skills where the ancestors are missing. Which is a total of 14.1% uh, percentage. And as, if the skills are handmade by us, I mean we can score 0% here 
they have a good working system. Okay, so the next one, because to progress good, you need to have good testing guidelines. So um, the testers need to see if somebody can progress. Like for the Stanford example, if a tester doesn't see that one rider is using his hand, it will kick the rider later if he's doing some stand-up trick or he needs to have the foot control. And this should be in there. So the testing method is exactly what this is about. So the riders, the testers are able to scan these limited uh, movement actions. So, and the skills should, because of that, evaluate on a qualitative basis. So see, we have this quality guideline based from the descriptions, the limited uh, movement actions are marked out, and our testing progress should be done based on that. Um, what does competition do here? I don't know, I had something in mind when I put the slides together, but I uh, can't remember, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, maybe it's the same for a competition. Uh, no, I see. In, in the skill levels, I remember now. <laughs> in the skill levels, um, the quality guideline should be to just mark out the limited um, limited movement checks. So these are forbidden. So they can get easily through that. And in competition, we have this quality of the trick. Like for the arabesque example in the last talk, we have this arabesque like that, and this clumpy arabesque like that, and this difference has been done in the competition, but not in the skill levels. Uh, and in training, you of course can use them as a qualitative guideline to find out these. So the test criteria is that they're only qualitative movement inspections. Oh, my slides are even faster than me. Um, so the result is that we don't have a qualitative testing method. We have this line here, and 10 meters away we have another line, and the riders need to pass the first line and the second line, and if they do, they succeed. And what's that? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can ride the trick however you want, and test is not looking if you do something which is not good. Um, or, for example, the, these turns in the square, you're not allowed to touch these lines. That's so stupid, because the testers are now looking on the floor to see if the tire is touching uh, the lines, instead of watching up uh, the rider if everything is perfect, if the hips are over the shoulders. Uh, no, that makes sense, doesn't make sense. If the shoulders are over the hips and not upside down, right? And to see if, if this is, because for the spin, if this is all right and fixed, you see, okay, you have your body, and, uh, your, your muscles are active and keep holding the spin. Um, yeah, this is what the even worse part is. <laughs> so, it is not watching on the movement execution, instead, the skill levels are tested on a quantitative uh, parameter and this is not good. So they go through the skill levels and say, okay, I can do that. And in reality, this does not work for everybody. Ah, yeah. Riders aren't allowed to touch some lines. Okay, we have that. Um, so. They, teach a wide, they should teach a wide variety of skills. What does, does that mean? A wide variety of skills means we have a bigger movement repertoire. And the opposite, if we have, uh, and the other thing, if we have a bigger movement repertoire, a rider is more likely to learn new tricks. Why is that? Can anybody imagine? The one rider is like, loves this trick and the other loves another. Now, um, so if you have a wider variety of tricks, say you can do a lot of tricks in a wide variety, not just stand glides and spins as the Japanese can do, um, but if you can do like the whole palette of different tricks, you are able to learn more of them or easier to learn of them. And why? 
So can you think of why you are able to learn more tricks when you can do more? This is the question. Is that? I think that might be unclear. Or did I give a better explanation now? It's tough, I know. <laughs> it's not easy. Have you already extended your baseline, you would say, so you build on, you have more to build on? Yes. Yeah, and I'll, to, give, uh, to, to explain a little bit further, it's because you can do it, uh, a movement in one direction and in the other direction, instead of doing it just in one direction, you know, okay, <coughs> if I do it a little in this direction, I already know this direction, I don't need to go that far because I know this is the other one, and you can better interpolate between all these. And the test criteria is, of course, are there lots of different movement patterns, patterns in the skill levels? And we get back to our big picture, maybe some time. Okay, so back to the colors now. We have very much variations in the skill levels. And these are the green ones, which are a duplication of the one foot pattern. We have the blue ones, which are a duplication of the sit out skills. Uh, we have the purple ones, like here, which are a duplication of the one foot wheel walk or wheel walk patterns. Like these two colors. I know the red one. I will come to the red one later. And the the yellow ones are the application of others, so miscellaneous that don't fit into the others categories. Clear? So we have a lot of variations here, like one foot forward, backward, circle, figure eight, and then still one foot. The same for one foot uh, for one foot rework, for we walk, the same for seat out skills, sit in back, sit in front. And they repeat the same movement pattern over and over again. And I counted them. So we still have a total of 85 skills. Um, we have a duplication of the one foot movement pattern, which is, happens to be 14 times. The same for the one foot move, we walk movement pattern, which is 11 times. Seat out skills are repeated 13 times, and muscular skills are repeated 8 times. And this is a total of 46 skills. So more than a half of the skills are just repeating the bone pattern. I mean, for training it's very, very good to repeat yourself, because then it gets more and more automated. But this should not be in the skill ups, as they should teach you a wide variety. So we have 54.1% of just a duplication here. And again, it should be zero. So, we do have some obsolete tricks, tricks that don't help you progress. And uh, you can, we can calculate them because they have low to zero importance based on the talk before. If you calculate the importance, it will be like zero, a very, very n low number. And, or the other thing is tricks that force aside. You should do it with the left foot, you should do it with the right foot. Uh, you do have a dominant foot. You should, and you use it in your first try. That's something your body does automatically. And, but, but sometimes a club is dictating you how, which one to use. So example, if you do a spin, and you can rotate left, right, or left. And for some group freestyle, it makes sense that all the club riders can do it to the right side. So then it makes sense. But for learning, or to have it in the skill levels, it should make sense there. It makes sense to train it in your uh, to, to, to uh, train it or to practice it at your home in your own uh, gym, but they shouldn't be in the skill levels. So the test criteria is to have no obsolete tricks, and the obsolete tricks are the red ones. And you see the red ones and those that have half red color. Both duplication and, non uh, and obsolete tricks. And the obsolete tricks, if you count them, are 26, which means you have 30.6% of obsolete tricks. Um, okay. So what does make the trick uh, obsolete? I'll go back. Oops. 
Uh, yeah, the first two items. Not useful. Can you give me an example for an obsolete trick? Yeah, riding between two lines that are 30 centimeters away. Ah, okay. Yeah, something like that. Thanks. Okay, so they don't help you progress into whatever, Brexit. <laughs> or, yeah. So we were here. Okay. Uh, skills that the skill level should give you ideas for new tricks. Uh, so if you're new to unicycling, you probably get a copy of the uh, of the skill level and see, okay, this is what I can do. Cool. And uh, the test criteria is that the tricks contain a lot of different unicycling uh, contain a lot of unicycling skills. And it turns out there are 85 skills plus mounts. And I think that's okay. <laughs> they can give you a good idea, a first start. And then if you reach some level, you already make out something on the internet to go even further. And this is where they're okay. So the good parts, those skills that comply with the goals before, so those skills that I didn't count before, are the good parts. Because they apply to these rules. And the test criteria is to count those that are left. And those are the grey ones. So we have just here, 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 and then somewhere over here. And it turns out there are 22 skills that really have a reason to be in the skill levels. And this is 25.8%. Very, very low. Just a quarter of the skills in the skill levels are Okay, so that's not very effective, right? Um, so my conclusion for this, uh, the skill levels should support your technical training because they reduce a little bit of the burden you need for the education and they give you a good start. And here's the validation into your table. So you have five criteria, but just one is met. And the good parts of this are only 22 out of 85. So this is not a high number, and I think we can score 100% here, because this is one thing made by humans. For humans, and we can do that. Yeah, we have an ape here, can ride in a unicycle. Okay, so the skill level development committee, I led this committee the last two years, I would like to give you a little history on this, the lessons we've learned during this committee, and what about the future for this one. So the history is, we founded this committee right after the Unicorn in New Zealand. Uh, the goals of this committee were set pretty early, and until the 22nd of May in 2010. The 30 first prototypes arrived on 3rd of June in 2010, and we were iterating over these prototypes for more than one and a half years. So my feedback stack at home with papers where I printed out the skill levels, showed them to people and the people get their pens and write into them. It was like this big with all, with all the uh, feedback from like almost everybody plus the feedback that was coming online. So there was very, very big um, uh, feedback coming in. And then the comments get finalized on the November the 27th last year. Uh, they are available in the IF blog. So here's the address. Uh, but if you go to the units at I think this is the last entry there. So if you go to the blog, it should be available there. And you can see the contents, and then you can uh, look at them. So, but we are still not finished here. Reported it in whole in early 2012, um, because there were some uh, um, uh, unclear things about how this community was progressing, because the people want to vote, and but we just can vote on how humans are working. Um, so we put it on hold, and the thing was, uh, I discovered there wasn't enough education in there, and this is why we have all these talks here. And 
they are made available afterwards. So um, we will restart this committee. Uh, st uh, re, 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 uh, was heißt aufgreifen? Continue, continue with the work that's already done, but with people that have more education for this. And the education will be for free, we're recording all of that. And so we can move on after the Unicon and to get all the people to the same education level. Because it was really hard. I mean, I come with the uh, background of a uh, sports scientist and it wasn't available to everybody. And I mean, I tried to explain it to everybody, but it wasn't just not working very, very good. And this is why we have these all these education stuff right now. Okay, so this is why I put this committee on hold. Say, okay, you need to get an education. I'll do that, and then we can continue. So the lessons learned because I led this committee is the girls change uh, while you progress and learn new things and we just had the goals set first then we learn new things but we didn't change the goals afterwards and uh, this is something should be done so you learn new things and makes oh, okay this what we've learned doesn't met our goal anymore so we should change them um, yes as I said you should iterate over the goals you have until you have reached an, another step or another uh, bright, brightly and shiny new idea or new discovery. Um, and as I've said, make sure that your committee members have the same knowledge level so they know enough to get in there and argue with the same uh, uh, arguments. And as of that, I had like this stack of paper at home with feedback and I think the feedback from the public is, I think, better than a gold mine. So if you do something, get feedback. It's really, really good. And what was really cool, I don't know, I hope it was really cool, I published the steps on the IF blog. So probably you were able to read them. I don't know if you did. Uh, but at least we had some communication to say about where we are, what we're doing, and stuff like that. Okay, for the future is that um, although the new skills, new skills aren't approved by the IIF yet, and we are not finished yet, you should use them anyways because the, uh, the levels we have now are not that good anymore. And not everybody has get that. So, even if the old ones are advertised, I would advise to use the new one because the old ones don't meet their own uh, purpose anymore. Uh, yes, this is something I already told you. We have a lot of talks, talks uh, to, to share the required knowledge. And I would like to invite those people who are interested in working on unicycling. Felix and me having a talk tomorrow at 10 o'clock this time hopefully in the conference room yes I'm sorry I don't know what we thought by 10 o'clock um, 10 o'clock in the conference room where we talk about the future of unicycle development and how it can be done uh, which tools to use and stuff like that and this committee will be restarted after the Unicorn so yeah Oh, cool, Felix, come on, look, our talk, <laughs> look, our talk tomorrow. Ten. Yeah, 10 o'clock, that's tough. Okay, and then these are my references for this talk, and I'm done. So, if there's still something to discuss, I'm happy to hear you. I'm happy to talk with you. And yeah, I wish you a good time and hope to see you tomorrow. Oh, we have a question, right? Yeah, um, the skill level is the one, but like me, I'm a teacher, but I'm not so good at green cycling. I'm just um, very happy to do this and to give it, um, but my good students are better than me. And if they had a question, I have to look in the, on the internet and it would be perfect if they 
would be a, an app for an iPod or something. Uh, Philip Henestrosa has done an iShit app. No, I call it iShit because I don't like Apple for these iProducts. Um, I mean, I have a Mac. I'm happy with that. But I don't like the Apple model of that. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, but it's available for iPod, iPad, okay. iWhatever. Um, for the mobile, for iOS. So let's talk for iOS. Um, and it will be, uh, it is already available. You showed me it like half an hour ago. Um, I think in some bucks, like five to ten euros, right? What is the name? Oh, what is it? You can find it on the, on the app store. For, it's called uh, the name of the guy. Yeah. yeah. Then you can find it. The okay. name of the guy? Uh, I can't remember his name. It's Philip. <laughs> Philip Hennis Trosa. Yeah. And so what we are, as I said before, I would like to uh, work on the dictionary as my diploma work and I would also like to include movement mistakes per trick so you can see okay I have a picture here yeah. compared to your rider and then you get a symptom and you can see the origin of the cause for that and then you get instructions what to do with your rider and how to uh, give him new instruction and feedback. So this is what I plan to do for my diploma, which maybe will be in a year. So there's still some things to do. And I need to pass my swimming test. <laughs> yeah, but this is something which I really like to do. And I think this will help, help many, many people. Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Nur ganz kurz, ich meine, jeder, also wenn ich unsere Kids angucke. Aber ein bisschen lauter bitte, damit ich es auch höre. Okay. Dann ich übersetze es dann, ja? Jeder unserer Kids hat sozusagen andere Bewegungsvoraussetzungen, was du auch vorhin gesagt hast. Und äh, jeder lernt anders. Also natürlich kann man jetzt sagen, okay, wir bringen allen das gleich bei, ähm, mit einer bestimmten Art, aber jeder hat auch eine andere Problematik. Das heißt, man muss sowieso gucken, der braucht die Hilfe, der braucht der, der mhm. hat die Problematik, weil du jetzt sagst von Mistakes, also. Ja. Wo ist der Fehler, warum er es nicht hing, was ist das Problem, warum er es nicht kann? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also. Yeah. So what she said is that everybody learns individually and they do have a different movement uh, experience and based on that you just have the m movement mistakes as I proposed them and you can just use these movement mistakes, put it on the rider and then give him uh, instructions. You need to work with the rider, of course. Yeah, yeah. There's, I can show you a list of what you do afterwards. Mm. Oh, there's a good book on that, uh, which you can re uh, borrow in the library. Um, there are like 10 or 11 advices from a sports pedagogist. Oh, yeah. okay. And this is the first good start, I think. She's talking about movement mistakes a lot. It was her doctor thesis. <laughs> Yeah. Anything else you want to know? I'm here to help. <laughs> anyway, if not, we are finished.